with gorgeous George and Go. This is what we do and why we do it, baby. We roll Covering MMA from all over the world. This is the Jay, premier you know stop for all hey, how you doing, combat sports needs. How you doing? MMA Junkie Radio, the only show broadcasting live from the Mandalay Bay Resort and Casino in the fight capital of the world, Las Vegas, Nevada. The lights are on and the mics are hot. It's time to get your MMA fix, junkies. Take it away, Big John. Gorgeous George and Goes, are you ready? Junkie Nation, are you ready? Well, let's get it on. From the fight capital of the world, inside the beautiful Mandalay Bay Race and Sportsbook, you are listening to the MMA Junkie Radio Show, the only show that matters. I'm your host, Gorgeous George, with me as always. Well, not today. Is the infamous goes. He's at Dana White Contender Series. But Richard Hunter I, is going to be co-hosting and producing with us. He's from the Phone Booth Fighting Podcast with Frank Mir. I can be devious and dastardly for a day. I'm going to be like. keeping my eye on you. Okay. We also have Classy Kelly handling the producing duties back east at the Series 6 Studios in New York. Hi, Kelly. Hello. All right. And then our special co-host uh, for the day is Jay Haran, former IFL uh, UFC, Bellator, veteran, and of course a staple, a longtime staple at Extreme Couture, and now of course he of the acting world. Yeah. What's up, Hollywood? How you doing? How you doing? Good. All right, man. Thanks Good to have you me. back. Always a pleasure. Hey, uh, w- our voices are going to be emasculated today, <laughs> just just to let you know. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, this guy's got the like great, great radio <laughs> voice. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And here it comes. Oh yeah, I got to warm it up. Hold on. <laughs> Especially when he gets that East... Uh, the East Coast swag going, yeah. you know what I mean? If we get them fired up, he'll start, you know, talking a little it. bit smack. The accent comes out. I can't shake the accent. It's there. Yeah, it's good it's to see you. It's not going anywhere. Thank you. All good right. To be here. So, folks, we have a fun show planned for today. Uh, us three will be tackling the latest news. We'll be catching up with Jay and everything he's got going on. Of course, in his world, he's a stuntman and an actor. Yeah, uh, buddy. Yep. And, and of good course, time. Richard has uh, the the the, the uh, phone booth fighting podcast with Frank Mears. So we'll, See what's next with him, what they got going on. And, uh, of course, we'll take your calls. 877-FIGHT-93 is the number to call in if you want to get involved with the show. Uh, That's 877-FIGHT-93 or 877-344-4893. You can hit us up on Twitter at MMA on SiriusXM. Uh, I'm also at MMA Junkie George and Richard's at Richard Hunter. All right. So, uh, Jay Haran, quick question for you. We we are going to touch on... uh, yeah, uh, the movie that's coming out and Tito Ortiz is going to be a guest of ours. You guys nice. were, you know, yeah, you guys right. were together on that. But you fought uh, Ben Askren. I did. And wow. I want to go back about woo. ten days or whenever that was. <laughs> People are still talking about it. You know, what, what, what did you think of that fight? And uh, who were you rooting for that night? By the way, uh, rooting wise, I wasn't. I just wanted to see a good fight. I thought it was a classic matchup of whoever implements their game first. Well, you know. Uh, Maz Vidal is the better striker. Of course, Askren's the better wrestler. So I was like, you know, yeah. I felt like if Askren got him down, it would have been a hard night for Maz Vidal. Mm-hmm. But, man, that knee <laughs> took care of everything. <laughs> but you don't take a stance in that, well, if Askren wins, it kind of makes me look better. I mean, you're you're far removed from that. But that fight took place, what, yeah, eight, ten years ago? Bro, I'm out the game, man. I'm gone. Yeah, so, <laughs> hmm. I'm a fan now. I just like to watch good fights. But, um. Yeah, I mean, he, you know, respect to Askren. He's one of the, you know, the his wrestling was um, at the time when I re- when I fought him. I, I never felt nothing like it. Yeah. You know? So, okay. You know, it was real awkward, and and um, you know, his pressure was was really good. So tell you what, we're gonna revisit this mm-hmm. because Tito's a little early today. He's already okay. on hold. Nice. <laughs> so there we're gonna go. bring in the former <laughs> UFC light heavyweight champion, who uh, is not done yet. By the way, he still has some gas in the tank. He's got a fight coming out. Uh, coming up in Combate Americas with Alberto Del Rio, but uh, also the movie that you know you share with them, Above the Shadows, yeah. which drops on Thursday uh, in select theaters and on VOD. Again, sorry, did I say Thursday? Friday. Friday uh, it's, yeah. it's called Above the Shadows, and joining us now is Tito Ortiz. What's up, Tito? How you doing? Great, guys. How you guys doing? Good. I'm a good one, man. Thank you for joining us here on the MMA Junkie Radio Show. Uh, I got Richard Hunter with me here from Phone Booth Fighting Podcast, and Jay Haran, who was uh, part of the Above the Shadows movie with you. My boy Jay. Yeah. What's up, Jay? Chilling, brother. Chilling. (laughs) Good to good to talk to you here or wherever. (laughs) In the office. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, uh, Tito, tell us about Above the Shadows. Uh, 
who came to you for this? Uh, like, have your connections just slowly grown, you know, through all these years of, of being in MMA? And, and uh, you know, or, or did this come out like from a group that you had never, ever worked with before? Um, it came from a group I never, ever worked before with. And I think they just, they needed a champion. They needed somebody with uh, a, a legend name, of course. And uh, being a former champion myself, uh, the person that I played, um, he was the champion. And Attila. he had the, the guy who was a star. Actually, it's uh, was it Alan uh, Richardson. He actually has to, tries to fight me for my title. Right. And um, it was actually a month and a half after my neck surgery, after I fought Chel Sonnen, and I had uh, three discs replaced to my neck. And I got this call for this film, and I thought, you know what? Ah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a movie. It's not going to be that bad. And, all of a sudden, I'm drilling. I'm hitting double A. <laughs> yeah, that's what people doing, uh, stunt people fight, and it was it was like doing literally a real fight every yeah. single day for the first uh, five days. We were putting in eight hour sessions, and it felt like I was in training camp again, and I was dying. Yeah. I mean, I literally was dying. <laughs> but Alan came in in superb shape, um, and he's a quick learner. You know, yeah. when I spoke with uh, Claudia, who's the producer of the film, she told me he goes, "Yeah, Alan has." Uh, so mixed martial arts um, history and wrestling history. And when we get there, he just had just a little bit. But, you know, we were able to work uh, through a lot of things, and he was in great shape. And, you know, we, we I think we put on a pretty good show. All right. So I wanted to ask both of you, how much do you have to carry the non-MMA fighters in an MMA scene? Like, I know they come prepared. I know they're in shape. I know they're usually pretty good athletes. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in the role. But uh, Jay first and then Tito, uh, how much do you have to, like, bring them along so that it's realistic? And, th and does that mean more pain on your body because, um, obviously, you're taking the bigger bumps? I would, it all depends. You know, some guys are athletes and, they, you know, they, get, they catch on quick. And, okay. you know, it just depends. You know, a lot of times I've, had, I've been blessed to work with a lot of good people and they've been into it. So, you know, and then when they know you're a real fighter, they kind of, you know, let their guard down and let you kind of – help them make the scene better so i've had nothing but good um scenarios being put in positions where they they really want to learn and they take the time to learn it right but like tito said i mean he thought he was going in oh it's just a movie i mean it's a lot of work you know the choreography the the you know to, to help and teach the other actor i mean you know just throwing punches for camera you know you got to know the angles and what sells for camera and then you got to you know it's repetition, so it's very hard. Let me ask a question about that. What is, in, in the world of legitimate MMA, have you guys found looks really bad on camera? You know what I mean? Like, what's the, what's the, the submission hold or the, the shot that we're always going to see in a fight where they're like, you know what, it just doesn't translate to the movie. Stay away from it. Anything? Yeah, a lot of, personally, I think a lot of MMA, it doesn't transition to film fighting well because... You know, even in an MMA fight, you'll see a guy that gets hit with something, and you don't. You have to see the replay, yeah, how yeah. he got knocked out. So those type of punches and stuff don't really sell for film fighting. You got to throw big loopy stuff for it to sell on camera, and just like submission stuff, like nobody Setting really up an Oma Plata or yeah, something. Yeah, like nobody <laughs> really knows what's going on. You yeah. know what I mean? And so, but it's 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 growing. Like MMA is growing so much, so now it is transitioning into film, and people are starting to get it when it's. It's shown on the film in the movie. Yeah. So Tito, you took a, yeah, you a, know, a, a got, lot of bumps. I agree, agree with uh, Jay on that. It was uh, no. I, I think throwing straight punches in a fight are the ones that win the fight. In a movie, it's not throwing straight punches because they don't look like they have anything on them. Mm -hmm. It's the big looping punches where it goes all the way across the camera, all the way across the guy's face, and literally to his knee. And it's the most sloppiest punch in the world. But those are the rocky punches. Those are the punches yeah. that people go, "Oh, that should have killed him. <laughs> I should have took his head yeah. off." But those aren't the type of things you would see in a normal fight as in an MMA fight in the UFC or Bellator or Combat to America or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the difference that is compared to a movie and the reality of really fighting. How much are you allowed to, like, freestyle, Tito? I mean, I know there's a script. This is a sequence of moves or whatever, you know, to for the scene. But how much are you allowed to just, like, play off? Like if something happens and, uh, you know, using somebody's momentum that you weren't thinking of, you know, to, as, as part of the sequence? Well, um, you know, um, I spent one week uh, in New York with uh, Alan Richardson, and we actually just 
it was just repetition over and over and over. Of course, coming from a wrestling background and coming from a coaching uh, background, uh, there was a fight choreographer helping out, and I was like, I was like, let's try this, let's try that, and let's just do it over and over again, over and over again. And we did it over and over again, where just we memorized it. And Alan is a really, really hard worker. I mean, there was times that it was like we had to come back for our second session, and I didn't want to get out of bed. And this kid was already showing up there. I was like, man, this guy's a hard worker. But it's just uh, one of those things that it just takes repetition over and over and over again. So when it is time to shoot it, the bigger you are when you do it, the better it looks on camera. And having the repetition of doing it, like I said, I mean, I came from a coaching background. It was easier to, to coach or to teach uh, Alan the moves where we caught each other and we could talk to each other. I'm like, here comes the right hand. Here comes the leg kick. All right, here comes the double leg. I mean, you can't really read lips on uh, camera unless you're face-to-face. I mean, that's the only time that really that. So we're able to walk through it. I mean, I think it made it a lot easier for sure. Mm -hmm. Tito Ortiz, our guest here on MMA Junkie Radio. We're talking about Above the Shadows, which comes out on Friday uh, in select theaters and on VOD. And also one of my favorite methods to get my hands on a movie is the pre-order on iTunes, which you can get. So that's available right now. Uh, Tito, so let me ask you something. Do you feel like, and Jay, you can answer as well, do you feel like uh, Alan Richson uh, had to up his level of threshold, his alpha male status, just because he's in there with you guys and, and uh, he knows it's going to hurt, but he can't show pain? Like, do you, do you feel like the guys become tough guys while you're working with them? Or, or, or you know, what, what would you say about most of the actors you've ever worked with? Let me tell you, I was pulling my punches. Um, I, I have done a little bit of pro wrestling before, just uh, not to people could see, but just uh, in the gym playing with some guys and, of course, drilling and wrestling. And when we spar and you want to go, all right, we're only going 20% today. Alan was taking all the blows. He was taking all the, the takedowns and hitting. I was hitting double legs over and over and over. I mean, there's a few times that I did knock the wind at him, but he was just a tough son of a bitch, man. And that kid... He actually is a hard worker, and he's super, super tough. And like I say, we put in the grind. I mean, I I was, like, really taken back to the fact that I was putting myself through these things after having neck surgery. I mean, I had three <laughs> discs replaced in my neck yeah. two months before that. And my doctor's like, what the hell are you doing? Terminator. Like, well, I, didn't, I didn't think this was going to be that hard, but, you know, every day I got through it. You know, and then there was times that Claudia, who was the director, producer that was there, she was like, are you okay, Tito? Are you okay? I go, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. You know, but every day that I got uh, back to the hotel, I would get ice. I would ice myself, and I'd get back to start shooting again. And But Alan really uh, took a beating, and he kept on going, man. He was like Energizer Bunny for sure. So, yeah. do, so do these guys up their level of toughness around you guys, Jay? You feel the um, same thing? I mean, again, I, I think once they, you know, again, me and Tito are probably brought in for specific roles like those, you right. know, fighter guy. And then when, when they know we're cast, they cast a real guy in there, they, they're kind of, they humble. I, I, I feel like the guys I work with, they, they're, they're fans of the, of the sport. Right. So they feel like, you know, they feel, oh, I'm fighting with a real guy. You know, they're kind of like, you know. It, it it just works well. Mm -hmm. Like the scene I did with Denzel in the car. I mean, he caught me with a couple elbows, and I was like, "Let's go again." You know what I mean? So he, after that, he right. really like, you know, he was like, "Oh, this guy," you know, he know he knew I was a fighter. But after that, he was like, "Oh, okay," you know. Right. So it it works out well. Yeah. And so, guys, let me ask you this last question for me. I'll turn it over to Richard. Like, uh, is this like, hmm, you know? Every, you guys grew up as athletes, mm -hmm. but does this also satisfy maybe – I mean, Tito's still competing, but uh, yeah. Jay, you first. You no longer compete, but you are still able to entertain, you know, yeah, and see your work. Uh, millions get to see your work. Yeah, definitely. You know, I don't know what I'd be doing if I didn't have something else that I was passionate about yeah. after a full 12-year-long fight career. So, for me, it filled, it filled that void for sure, and now I have a new passion in whether acting, fight scenes, stunt work, and, and um, you know – I'm all in. You so. in love with acting too, Tito? Man, I love it. Actually, I just finished a film, what was it, uh, two months ago with uh, Bruce Willis. Uh, it's called Trauma Center. Look at these and guys. Wow. Shit, Tito's I, been in the was, game, uh, acting game, way since Cradle in the Grave. Cradle to the Grave. Yeah, these exactly. guys. I mean, I've been, I've been in the fight game for 22 years. Jeez. Jeez. Oh, Bruce Willis. Wow. Man. Good stuff, yeah, Tito. Well, 
Right. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I didn't play a fighter. You know, I played a cop who was just a, a villain cop who was trying to get this girl and trying to get the chip from her, and I was just hunting her nice. down. And I found her and ended up shocking the hell out of her. And um, it was cool because I'm a, I'm a person with repetition, and I pay attention to detail. I want to see what the director is doing, how he's doing his job and angles he's getting and the things that he's looking for. And I was there sitting next to him. He was like, wow, what? You were one of the first guys I've really seen to really sit next to me and watch everything I want to do. I want to see what you're looking for on camera. I want to learn this stuff. I mean, the only way yeah. to learn it is to watch it and to see it and to, to master it. As I did when I first started wrestling, I walked in the wrestling room as a freshman. I did it as, because I thought it was WWE. I didn't know it was uh, amateur wrestling. I knew nothing about it. I walked in the wrestling room going, where's the ring? But it became repetition. It became hard work, dedication of prevailing through the things that people would quit on. And when you're doing 14 hours, or excuse me, 14 hour uh, uh, shoots, I mean, those are long days and they're back to back to back to back, but you still have the same intensity each and every uh, moment that you're on camera. It's hard to do, yeah, but I yeah, love it. It's, it's that feeling that I get when I'm fighting that I have to be on point. If I let myself relax for a second, I'm going to get knocked out. I'm going to get submitted. I'm going to get taken down. I'm going to get hit with a shot, but I got to be on point every time. As you go on camera, you got to be on point. And it's not on the point where it's over aggressive. It's just like conversation. You got to have a reaction to their action, not just wait for it and give your your response. It's just you got to wait for them and like, all right, cool. Now here's my response to you. And it, it's a learning. It's a working process. It's it's something that I think uh, I will continue to do. I love it. You know, I got two fights with Kabata America. I'll be done with that. And I think the acting world uh, is something I really want to chase into and continue doing. UFC. Yeah. Uh, former Absolutely. UFC heavyweight, to heavyweight champ he Tito Ortiz on the line. Sorry, Sorry just to touch on what Tito said. He brought up a great point. He's he said he's coachable. That's what it takes to do anything. You know, with, you know he was a world champion in mixed martial arts. Now he's going and acting. I take the same approach. Yeah, I'm coachable. You know, if the director saying something, you got to be coachable. Gotcha. You know? So right. that's good. Richard Hunter from the Phone Booth Fighting Podcast. What do you well, have for Tito? Here's a question for both you guys. Uh, and having not seen the movie yet, I don't know who did scenes with which actors and everything. But but watching the trailer, the first thing that jumped out to me about this is one of the main stars of this movie is David Johansson, who was the lead singer of one of the most influential rock bands of all time, the New York Dolls. Did uh, either one of you guys get to meet him at all? Oh, I didn't. I had a small cameo in the movie. I played like right now. I'm playing a, a sports announcer. I just had a few days, but I had a good time. I worked with uh, the director, hands on with the director, and um, she's great. Um, it was uh, it was a good time. She was real positive and humble. And um, Claudia Myers is her name. And um, again, uh, just happy to be a part. I know Tito's in it. He has a big scene. He plays the um, the big fight scene. Yeah. And um, yeah, but I didn't meet him. Uh, Tito, did you get to meet him? I know I, I didn't get a chance to meet him. It was pretty much me and Alan Richardson the whole time. Okay. Uh, Megan Fox was on on set. Um, Olivia was on set, and of course Claudia, the uh, the uh, director, she was there on set. But I didn't get a chance to meet him. But I mean, we're, we're really just putting on a fight. I mean, there's a few times the guys that were the extras were going, "Were you guys really fighting in there?" I mean, that, <laughs> that's how real the fight was. Yeah. So. That's I think how. we got some good stuff on camera. And it's, I think it's just a heartfelt feeling of uh, what Olivia's done um, with Alan as actors. I, I think they found what people are really going to be looking for for this film. This is not just a fight film. Yeah. This is not just exactly, about MMA. Exactly. This, is about, this is about, you know, a, a guy who's on his way of trying to be a world champion as a girl who lost herself and is finally being noticed by the main star alan and he real realizes that she's alive and she realizes like she know i'm not alive i've been gone for such a long time and he actually or she actually is his uh inspiration and there's one scene that was so great that was inside of the cage and it was in between rounds and alan's sitting on the uh stool and is looking at olivia and i forget her uh her her name for the film but uh She's like, you can do this. Come on, you can do this. And he looks down, and she's like, you see me. You see me. And it was just so heartfelt. And it was just like, well, it was like almost like a tearjerker type of feeling of, like, that passion and that love and that feeling and that affection that people have towards each other when love is, in a, in a, is a factor. 
Mm-hmm. And I think this film is going to do really well. I just, uh, it was a good experience for me because once again, um, I was able to see different angles. Uh, the director was directing different ways. And I was trying to learn and be a student of the game as I was in mixed martial arts. Yeah, she plays the part of Holly, by the way. All right. Yeah. Did you have anything else, Richard? No, I was just okay. going to say, you know, that, that sounds like uh, that's a very important component of the film, that what Tito just said, is it's not just an MMA exactly. movie. Because yeah. you'll bring MMA fans to the movie, but mm-hmm. MMA fans usually have wives or kids, or, you know. <laughs> ah, it <laughs> Some touches all areas. Exactly, it's, uh, yeah. It's, uh, you know, yeah. drama, it's fantasy, of course, it's action with the MMA. Tito's in it, he's a legend. You know the other guy, uh, the main actor, Alan, Alan Richardson. Richardson yeah. He was in great shape. I saw he was actually there. One the of the day. Ninja Turtles. Yeah, he was actually there the day I was there. I'm like, damn, this dude's in shape, and um, you yeah. know, he definitely got in shape for that fight scene. And um, yeah, again, the director Claudia Meyer, she's great. She has great energy, positive, and uh, like I agree with Tito, I think it's gonna be a great uh, film. Definitely. Enjoyable, entertaining, you know, touches Tito. across the board. Tito, while we got you here, just the last question. Alberto Del Rio, who who came up with this one? Uh, your idea, Combate's idea? How, how did this come about? Oh, man, that was a complete Combate's idea. Um, Campbell actually told uh, or asked me and George Prejean, uh my partner with uh, Primetime 360, our management company, and said, let's go to lunch. And I went to lunch with him, and he sat us down and he gave me an offer I could not refuse. He says, uh-huh. Alberto Del Rio would like to fight you. And I go, are you, are you sure? <laughs> are you talking about the same guy I'm thinking about? He goes, yeah. And he says he could beat you. I'm like, okay. <laughs> All right, this is, this is a joke. You guys, there's, just, there's no joke about this. And there was no joke about it. And I, I, they gave me a number. I gave them a number back. And they didn't even blink in it. And I was like, shit, I knew I should have asked a little bit more. <laughs> but it was fun. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it's a good, it's the, it's the best number that I've had, I think, almost ever in my career. Wow. I'm a very wow. good uh, Campbell. Um, I have good an opportunity, you, you know, at 44 years old. I've good been in the sport you. for 22 years. Uh, my, my mind's there. My body's there. You guys seen what I did to Chuck Liddell. I made him look like an old man. Um, I think... Chuck has really started a fire under my ass, and at the same time, you know, I had to talk to Randy Couture and ask him, Randy, when you were 43 years old, what made you come back and win the uh, heavyweight world title? He's all, Tito, I-, I wasn't done. I really mm-hmm. felt like I wasn't done. Well, let me tell you people, I don't feel like I'm done. And when you talk about I just have some, a little bit of fuel left in my gas tank, I got a full tank, and uh-huh. I'm ready to smash out Booker Del Rio. I'm going to make him look like Chuck Liddell. I'm going to make him look like a clown, but... He says he's in shape. He's been going. Uh, he's been training now for the last six months. You know, I, I know he's uh, in San Antonio, but also trains in Mexico in high altitude at the the training or the national training center there. Uh, coming with a uh, amateur uh, was it uh, wrestling career and having a nine and five MMA career. Coming, of course, from the WWE, so he, he holds a lot of uh, weight. Yeah, and for so sure. I think some fans would love to see me beat him down, and uh, I'm excited because. I finally get to get paid to get in shape, and I get paid to do something I love to do, and that's entertain the fans. And for this summer, I'm going to get in some great shape, as I was last summer, and my timing's there, everything's there, and, uh, you know, this is just another job for me, and, and I'm excited to entertain my fans, how they've been doing over the last 22 years. And just to clarify, you're saying the number Combate's paying you is more than you ever made with UFC, Bellator, anybody? Yep. Wow. We'll figure, That's huh? Impressive. Wow. Okay. Well, oh, good man. for you, man. Why, why, why wouldn't I do it? I'm, I'm, I'm in. I'm, I'm <laughs> Absolutely. All in. I'm with I'm you, brother. In. Let's go. Yeah, because I would have thought you would have wanted yeah. to just ride off into the sunset after the Chuck win. That was, you know, a great win for you. I, I, I thought that would have been it, but I guess this number must have been up there. Well, you know, um, once again, it just comes to that thing that I, I don't want to be 50 years old and look back and go, damn, I should have did it when I was 43 or when I'm 44. I should, I should, I should have continued to do it. Now I can look and I can say, you know what? I am doing it. Mm-hmm. I am going to press the envelope. I am going to make it happen. I'm going to do what Randy Couture did. I'm, I'm going to come back and I'm going to win another fight. I believe in myself. I believe in just the hard work ethic that I've had through my life, through my career, uh, my career of, of, of MMA, of just pushing the envelope as much as possible. You know, I, all the surgeries I've had, and I'm still doing it. Uh, I want to give a motivation to all of my fans who kind of look up to me, who are my age, we have problems getting off the couch and, you know, get to work or even get to the gym to believe in yourself and make it happen, you know, motivate them to make it happen and believe in themselves to make it happen because I'm doing it and I know it's possible. 
anything's possible in this world as long as you believe in yourself and you make it happen. Right on, my man. Hey, thanks so much for the time. Uh, we look forward to Above the Shadows coming out on Friday. And thanks for the time here and talking a little bit of MMA with you and Alberto DeRio coming up here on, for Combate Americas. Great stuff. Uh, we really appreciate it. Yes, for sure, man. Thank you. Okay. Talk soon, it. Tito. Cheers. See you later, brother. Hopefully, uh, we'll see you uh, in, in the film world, brother. Yes, yeah. sir. See you soon, man. Definitely. All right. There you have it. Tito Ortiz on Twitter, at Tito Ortiz. And, again, the movie's called Above the Shadows. Uh, with Alan Richson, Megan Fox, and, of course, our MMA friends Tito Ortiz and Jay Heron are also in this movie. Yeah. It drops on Friday on VOD and in select theaters. And, of course, you can do the pre-order like I already did uh, via iTunes. So get on it and, and uh, get to cracking. And yep. we'll be right back, folks. Folks, it's MMA Junkie Radio on Fight Nation Channel 156. Stay close. We'll be right back.
Here's, here's Sirius XM now when you're out of the car. Now included with most uh, Sirius XM uh, subscriptions. Hear more of what you love, get more control over how you listen, and have more ways to listen anytime and anywhere you want it. Sirius XM Video. It gives you a backstage pass to your favorite shows available online and on the app. Just create a username and a password, and you're ready to start streaming. Learn more at SiriusXM.com slash more. Got Richard Hunter here from the Phone Booth Fighting Podcast with Frank Mir and Jay Haran, former IFL, UFC, and Bellator veteran. Uh, Jay, so going back about 20 minutes, we were just in the middle of a little Ben Askren talk because yeah. you shared the, uh, the, I guess it was the Bellator cage. I don't, yeah. th- I don't think they have a name. I don't know if it's Decagon or whatever. Split decision, right, mm-hmm. in that fight. Uh, so you were almost the first guy to hang an L on this guy, um, and what I, I was, meant was I won that fight. <laughs> and what I, yeah, what I yeah. meant was, uh, do you root for the guy because he, because I guess the more he continues to win, maybe you know whatever, or do you want to, you know, like did he ever just get under your skin so much that you wanted someone to eventually take him out? Nah, well? not at. I'm so far emotionally detached from anything. Plus, I know wrestlers like to hang together too. Yeah, you know? nah, I just wanted to see a good. Now I'm about just seeing a good fight i thought the the styles were so different it could have been you know whoever implemented their game um came out and like if ben took him to the ground it would have been a rough night for uh masvidal but he did you think about took all that away uh, with that flying knee man 2000, that was crazy. 2011 did you think about throwing a flying knee like that adam um not 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 in that not in that way yeah. no i mean I, I had that in my backpack but i didn't think of just running in and throwing a straight flying knee in the air i threw a spin back kick the last round and dropped him but yeah it was a little i guess it was a little too late yeah but yeah that knee came out of nowhere holy holy cow Put well sleep s- speaking of miles at all him and his team kind of made a statement today and they said that george has narrowed mm-hmm. himself down to two options mm-hmm. one kamaro uzman two conor mcgregor I almost read it like they were funneling info of what they had agreed with to the with the UFC, but it looks like that's just more like internally what they've decided. You know, mm-hmm. like don't come to us with any other offers. Um, I think that's fine. I mean, I don't know that it always works. You know, yeah. to to back the UFC to attempt to back the UFC into a corner, but I, I like the stance they're taking it, and this is the time to do it because they have some leverage. Hey man, I agree. Strike while the iron's hot. You know, when your your name's out there and you get probably sell the most tickets or get your biggest payday why not that hey, said why not what do you guys think is the best move for him the 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 conor mcgregor fight or the title fight uh i mean they're both probably you know there's a there's a pot of gold to both at, at the end of both rainbows right right i think he has the belt on one hand or a big payday on the other and he beats a you know the guy with a big name and if he beats this guy with the title, he's the champ. So either one, I mean, that's a smart, you know, that's smart to say I only want these two fights. Right. I, I think the better business move would have to be the Conor McGregor fight. Oh, just I was because, hoping you wouldn't say that. Because really? Because of the sales. Sure. Business move? But he, why does he get a pay-per-view cut? I mean, he's just going to be able to present a number all out Tito Ortiz. Kind of like, all right, I'll fight him. Here's my number. Uh-huh. But, yeah, but what else does he really get? You know, like, you have to wear oh. Reebok in. Oh, I'm oh, sure oh. there'll be some fight oh, you're saying But I would think it'd, it'd be better to go and try and be the champion and then let Conor McGregor come to you. Yeah, I mean, the big... The Granted, point. you got to get Why the we're in this game, yeah. I mean, most of real fighters or, you know, you want to be the champ. I so, would think so, I man. mean, that's a big, you know. And stylistically with... Uh, with um, Usman, I mean, you know, he's, he's a wrestler, so... You know, he could probably do a similar training camp to what like he did, what he just did for asking yeah. him. I think with McGregor, it's more of probably a striking fight. But again, I mean, it's both both are good options. I mean, he definitely strike while the iron's hot. Why not? Just, you know, that's, that's smart. You know, we want these two guys. That's it. We're not fighting any, you know, up-and-coming guys. Why? Why? Uh, we want to fight right this two guys so we could build our brand. Mm-hmm. Both are good options, but uh, Usman is a good option because he has the title. McGregor's a good option because he's McGregor. Mm-hmm. And the thing about Masvidal is, as much as this fight did to elevate his stock, and I think it did, 
I always come back to the casual fan, not the hardcore, not the people who follow this on a day-to-day basis, but the the friend of the friend who maybe buys one or two pay-per-views a year and, you know, has to decide whether or not to buy it. He buys it if he sees Conor McGregor's name on there. So I would say that a fight with McGregor, even at this point for Masvidal, could elevate his stock even further by putting him in front of those casual eyes. Yeah, I, I, I just think of like what happened to Nate Diaz. I feel like he just sat around waiting for Connor to come back, twiddling the thumbs. Yeah. I mean, it's been almost three years. He's going to mm-hmm. fight Pettis next month. Yeah, that's Waiting crazy. for that dance partner mm-hmm. while McGregor went out and fought Habib. Let me, let me tell you he something fought, to a week. Uh, Mayweather. You can't, you can't outrun for the time. Right, <laughs> and that's three <laughs> key that. years that yeah. Nate Diaz yeah. could have maybe yeah. forged his own legacy. In your prime. And exactly. You know, like the same way Connor knocked also up. Eddie, Honor. maybe Diaz could have done that. But, I mean, I but, don't know. But again, I mean, the, it could be the best thing too for Diaz because he he's a warrior. He goes out there and lays it all on the line. So he could have, it could have been great for his body just to repair. Three years though. Yeah, it's a little long. I long agree. Time. But still, I'm just that that you watch his last five fights, all wars. Yeah. So he definitely needed some time off. But yeah, I agree. Three years is a little long, but. Still, his style of fighting. I mean, it's like miles on a car, dude. You got, you just run it and run it. After a hundred thousand miles, you know. <laughs> right. The other point I would raise about Nate and Nick, for that matter, both Diaz brothers, is that in their particular cases, there's a mystique to them because they're not only outlaws, but there are these enigmas where you know money doesn't seem to matter uh, uh, the most to them and and they will go away for a couple of years if they feel like it you know they play by their own rules so i think in that particular unusual case it doesn't maybe hurt nate as much as it does other fighters because they're already known as these renegades yeah it ain't gonna hurt his his reputation at all i mean but i heard but i heard he was in great shape for the poirier fight before didn't uh nate Yeah. Yeah. I heard he was in incredible. Well, he was in great shape shape. for the Michael Johnson fight. Yeah, but that fight didn't happen. But I heard, and that was recently. Mm -hmm. So he's always training. So those guys always train, both Nick and Nate. So it ain't going to be, I I mean, I don't know how much ring rust. I don't even know if that that counts, if, if somebody like that is always training. Right. But I tell you, I think three years is too long. But I do think. A rest with those guys, like it helps them rejuvenate their body. Cause, right. Because every time they step they in, that in, crate, in that cage, yeah. they're going to war no matter what. That's just their style. They're getting hit. They're hitting you back. Period. They, you know, they're gonna get cut. They're gonna get stitches after the fight. That's just how they fight. Mm-hmm. Well, I I look back on Connor's last six fights. Throw out the Mayweather fight, right? And he fought. Um, we'll go in reverse order. He fought mm-hmm. Habib, title mm-hmm. fight. And then prior to that, it was uh, Eddie Alvarez, title fight. Then he had the two Diaz fights, non-title fights. And then before that, Aldo and Mendes, both title fights. So four of his last six were title fights. Now, the Diaz fight, the first one only happened because RDA got hurt. Rafael Dos Anjos was the champion at the time. So what would that have been? A title fight. He got removed. Diaz got plugged in. That thing blows up. He loses. He has to fight him again. That's why I've always said if Diaz would have continued or if Jorge elects to maybe go the Usman route, and attract him that way, Connor goes towards the title fights. He wants to fight for title fights. Now, what happened with Floyd was just something completely different. That was just a big money fight. But yeah. other than that, it seems like he's always navigating towards that or at least just the big paydays, which is something that I don't think anybody would have predicted 1.5 million pay-per-views for him and Diaz. I mean, we all knew, like, hey, this thing could be good, but wow, that surprised everyone. So I think that's why they had to run it back, and then they went 1.65, which broke the record of 1.6 for UFC 100 with your man Frank Mir and and uh, Brock Lesnar. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I I don't know. I've always felt like that's the magnet to also pull him in. So I've always encouraged the fighters just go on with your career, you know, especially especially Nate. Like th- yeah. that trilogy is always going to be there because those two don't like each other. So whether they're both coming off losses yeah, or wins, it's there. I mean, too, you're only as good as you feel with what you're worth, too. So I mean. He was probably seeing some stuff like contracts, and he's like, "Why? Why am I going backwards?" You know what I mean? Money wise, too. You know. People I heard he made eleven million. Yeah, that's great. He sh- as he should. They put on some great shows. I mean, one point six five million people. A lot more fighters should be paid a lot more money. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's just the rumor know? that I heard. Nothing confirmed. Nothing yeah, like. Yeah, but a but lot more fighters should be paid a lot more money. 
Yeah. You, know, they, you leave a little piece in yourself I never in there every much. time Hell you get yeah, there. you do. Hell so yeah. it's like, you know, nobody sees after five years after you retired and when you broke down, your knees are hurting, you busted the ACL a couple times, your shoulders bumped, you know, those fans are long gone, you know. Again, like Tito, you just Dude. had him on. He's a legend. Chuck Liddell, legend. Randy Couture, legend. These guys should all never have to worry about money. They built this so, sport. So let me ask you a question. I, I actually have a question related to that. In MMA, I think th I think it's fair to say you probably you just basically answered the question. Mm -hmm. You should have made more money, Absolutely. but you didn't. You, you're part of an era where you guys helped build it, and That's it. it'll just keep going. The generations that follow will make more. If MMA can lead you to enough stunt work and TV work and you know actor roles, where all of a sudden it does pay off and it you did do my well, job. will I, you will you still I, like I, do you have an, a love for MMA I or do you feel like it spit chewed I, you up and spit you out? I love the sport. I love it. mixed martial arts. It changed my life from a negative to a positive. I won a world title. I did some things. I felt I could have done a lot more. It didn't work out the way. My path didn't go the way for my full potential. But but it changed my life and I'm doing something else I love now. It opened doors that possibly wouldn't have been open for me that I would have never known I was going to be an actor or do fight scenes in movies. I've never had, you know, said I'm going to do that when I'm a kid, you know what I mean? Right. But I love it. So yes, it's a it's a win for me. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I still feel like, you know, going back, we should get uh, fighters should get paid a lot more. You know, especially legends like you kind of like a royalty, like what actors get absolutely. from when, uh, absolutely. TV shows are syndicated or whatever. Fighters should get residuals whenever they residuals. show. Residuals, there you go. Whenever you show a fight, you know, guys should get broken off some money. Absolutely. I mean, that's again, people don't understand. When Was you it get the Goulet fight that you spilled the most blood? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that, that's the one. That, that's the one you should get a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> we should all get it. You know, a lot of get guys going there. You get knocked out. That's leaving a little piece of time that you'll never get back. You know, you get cut. You get stitches. You know, you get surgery. People don't understand that. Now you got to heal up. You know, um, it's just it's a rough business. It's a rough business. You have to love it to do it. You have to love it to excel at it. It can't just be about money either when you start. It's, if you're thinking, oh, I'm going to make money with this. It's all about money. I want to do this. And you're thinking the wrong way. You got to fall in love with the with the sport and training. And then when you do that, then everything else comes with that, hopefully. Sometimes it doesn't. You know, sometimes you just do it and, you know, you just stay in shape and you're, you're just a guy that goes to the gym. You know, everybody's path is different. But... It's still, it's good for your head. It, it keeps you in, in line. It's it's uh, so many positives than, than negatives to it. I mean, I'm just talking about a little bit of the business side of it yeah. that, you know, we don't get paid as much as, as we should, as we're worth. But it's still, there's a lot more great things about it than the bad things, you know. It's, it is a business. So there's always going to be promoters and, and, and managers and, and all that stuff that comes with it. Mm -hmm. All right, let's take a quick break. You're listening to MMA Junkie Radio on Fight Nation, Channel 156. We got some Twitter beefs to go over. Jones and John Jones and Corey Anderson and Anthony Smith, they got something going on. Of course, oh, Ben man. Askren and Jorge Masvidal still keep lobbing stuff to each other. Uh, 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 Uriah Faber, I think, and <laughs> Henry Cejudo. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And we got to do our daily debate. So it'll be great to have a former pro fighter here and, of course, a fellow media member in Richard Hunter. So stay close. We'll be right back.
dummy. Or even social media. Instagram. Snapchat. Instagram. Snapchat. The same applies to the biggest stories in MMA. Time for MMA Junkie Radio's Daily Debate. Today's Daily Debate question for the MMA Junkie Radio team, which is just me today. But I have Richard Hunter here from the Phone Booth Fighting Podcast with Frank Muir. And former IFL champion Jay Haran, former UFC belt and Be- Be- Bellator vet- yeah. veteran as well. On the heels of Uriah Faber's successful comeback fight, wow. which recently retired fighter would you like to see uh, return to action? <laughs> Michael Bisping, Alexander Gustafson, George St. Pierre, or other? Uh, feel free to plug in another name of a, of a tire that... A fighter that's recently retired and, and you'd like to see come back. So you well, start off, Richard. If I had to pick one of those three actual names, I would say uh, Gustafson, just because I think yeah. he's the one that's got the most in the tank. But if if it's okay, because uh, Uriah Faber, your Faber sparked the conversation, my other pick is Uriah Faber, because to me. I don't know that I have ever seen somebody step away from the sport for as long as he has at his age and then look like he had as much left in the tank as he did this past weekend. Mm -hmm. I can't think of a better example. Mm -hmm. I'd have to sit for a while to come uh, up with one. Dominic Cruz kind of came back and looked pretty good against uh, Chan. Wait. Oh, boy. But that wasn't a retirement, though, right, per se? I mean, well, that, he, was that was a lot. he was about for about three years. But there was a lot of injuries. And yeah, stuff. it was a I lot mean, of injuries. But he actually yeah. looked pretty good no, in, he in did. the comeback he fight. Did. I can't remember but if it it's an, But I'm talking about like if it's – Mizugaki, I think. Yeah, but if it's an announced – that was Mizugaki. Yeah. But if it's an announced retirement, gotcha. like, you know, where, I, hey, I'm stepping away, I, I can't think of a, a, a better candidate for that than Faber based on what I saw this weekend. How about you, Jay? Any um, of those three names or can you think of another one? Yeah, I think, like he said, I think Gustavuson probably, you know, had the had the most left in his tank. He just, I don't think he was really finished. He probably just emotionally after that fight and announced it probably he's good for him just to take some time off. Personally, uh, I don't like seeing the vets coming back after retirement after a few years. R- Uriah Faber is different. He's a... He's a little superhero, but and he, need, on he the, needs a pretty clean lifestyle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But again, I mean, I just feel like I don't like seeing guys tarnish their their legacy. You know, what I mean, coming back and I mean, again, we you can't outrun for the time. This game, the fight game, is not. You know what I mean? It's not. It's not forgiven. Yep. You know what I mean? It, it's just. It's real, and that's what you gotta love about it too. It's just real. I mean, you show up, you in shape, it shows. You show up and you're not in shape, it shows. You too. You old overnight, it shows. You know what I mean? So I just like don't like seeing the vets that were once the baddest men in the world, and then now you see the decline of them. You know what I mean? So again, on that list, yeah, Gustavuson probably has. Uh, you know, I just th- think he announced a little early, but still, he yeah. might feel I respect. An emotional but I do respect any man that says, you know what, I'm done. I'm, I mean, I go out on my shield. I did what I did. Time to, you know, turn over a new leaf, new career. I respect that because I did that. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm all, I'm all for that. You go out, you see, you know, because again, it's not forgiven. You can't just, you don't want to be left on your last couple fights, and that's what you're known for. When you had this whole career full of badass fights that you know you went in and did your thing wait till you hear mine i'm mm-hmm. gonna go with the route of other i mean of course i'd like to see <laughs> any of these guys come back gsp versus anybody's a great money fight mm-hmm. i still f- i agree with you guys gustafson's got uh, gas left in the tank and he's one of the top five light heavyweights out there how about anthony johnson mm. oh yeah right he's heavyweight now i think he's a heavyweight <laughs> yeah you're right well, i agree with that but he's also got a heavyweight type of you know oh, yeah. the way he swats people you yeah. know what i mean yeah oh he got so heavy i feel like he fits the category of gas left in the tank because i, I think he's still like early 30s or whatever mm-hmm. uh he's not past the 4-0 mark or nothing like that and when he comes back if he comes back right away he's a star plug him in against anybody and right away you're like oh man i gotta see that fight you True. know what i mean yeah. So I went the route of other. Here's how it broke down, though. Most people just said GSP, the low-hanging fruit. He's a superstar. Who doesn't want to see him fight? Yeah. 66%. 16% agreed with Jay and Richard at uh, for Alexander Gustafson. 12% said Michael Bisping, thanks to the U.K. People for voting. They always back their guy. 6% went with other. Uh, and that's your Nick Diaz's of the world and 
uh, Anthony Johnson yeah. and whoever else may be out there. Maybe Matt Wyman if he wants to give it another run. I don't know. So there you have it. There's today's Daily Debate brought to you by MMA Junkie Radio, Richard Hunter, and Jay Haran. And now I want to ask you a question uh, about father time. I keep hearing that phrase, guys, father time. <laughs> they say father time's undefeated, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, didn't Uriah Faber just beat Father Time the other day? Yeah, not because uh, if he would have lost, they would have said, "Oh, Father Time got him." So, <laughs> not, not, do, are, not is, a, are you ever eligible to give Father Time a, a yeah, uh, a, yeah. An L? I mean, this case is Randy Couture. Yeah, like Tito said, he won a wor- he won his world title after being kind of retired, semi retired, came back, knocked out, uh, beat Tim Sylvia, which. Nobody gave him a chance. That's incredible. 43 years old, Uriah Faber. There is cases, but mostly, yeah. you know, guys come back. It doesn't go that well. Sometimes you know I mean? Father Time has tougher fights than others. Father Time did not land a five-second. He has second. a great record. Yeah, Father, Father Time did not land a five-second knee on Uriah <laughs> Faber. That was a five-round war with Uriah Faber. Even the Globetrotters lose from time to time, and they're supposed, <laughs> to lose, they're, so, they're supposed to beat the generals every night, you know. But look it up. It hasn't happened in I don't know how long, but – Tom Brady, he's kind of beating Tom, uh, yeah. Father Time right mm-hmm. now, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, and I feel great, too. I mean, not to to get in the cage and fight, but I, I go in the gym. I train. What I if Combate comes guys? to you and, and has that lunch that you had with Tito Ortiz, and they go, write down your number. What, I, what's your number to come back? Yeah. I mean, there's some numbers I couldn't turn down, but I, it's just not my passion. I'm not looking for it. Oh, I okay. Mean, I'm, I'm doing okay what I'm doing now, so. You know, and I always went on feel, like not even age when I was thinking about retiring. It was all feel when I don't feel that fire anymore burning. I still feel to train and do all that, just the business side of it. I kind of was like, nah, I'm not really into that. But um, I'm not looking for that. I'm okay. not really. So there's I'm, no I'm number, happy with what I'm doing. There's no number that will bring you back. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I'm not going to turn down. If I told you, if somebody came with some number I couldn't turn down, I'd, I'd fight. Yeah. But it'd be just for the money, and it would be a money a fight that I couldn't turn down the money for. Yeah, and I'd fight my my ass off, but I'm not looking for that. I know that's probably not going to happen. So and it's not the fight, right? It's the camp that sucks. No, the, I mean, I never had a problem with the with with the camp, the yeah. training, uh, sparring, anything like that. It's the business side of it that you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Dealing with the whole the business side, not feeling. You know, you're getting what you're worth and just that whole side of it. I see. Yeah. So, again, I'm I'm so far removed now that and I'm got so so occupied. I'm so focused on what I'm doing. I'm, it's not even a thought in my mind. But I'm not stupid either. If somebody came and said, Jay, we want you to fight for this amount, and I've never seen those type of numbers before, I would definitely consider it. But I d- it's, it wouldn't happen. Jay Haran versus Ben Askren will pay you 250 grand. You win? <laughs> uh, 500 grand? Yeah, I mean. Yeah, okay. Uh, I got his yeah, attention. A little more, I mean. But, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's not it's not, it's not going to happen, and, and right. I'm not, it's not my passion. Again, I always went off feel. Like, you know, I get a fight, all right, I get that fire burning, start training, setting up everything. I just don't, you know. Okay. I like going in and helping the guys. All right. <laughs> And fight. it's true because when I go to Extreme Couture, Jay Haran's there like 95% of the time. He's still a gym rat. Jay, uh, me, real quick, uh, Richard, we're going to do just a 60 minute break. Oh, 60 yeah, second yeah. break. Okay, I got so a top of the hour break. Okay. When we come back, go ahead and lead off with that question. Richard Hunter over here on my left from the Phone Booth Fighting Podcast along with Frank Mir and Jay Haran, former IFL world oh. champion as well as a veteran of the UFC M Bell Tour. Top we'll gun be, right now. We'll be <laughs> right back in 60 seconds, folks.
All right, Richard Hunter. You, uh, I had to cut you off there towards the end of the first hour, but go ahead and lead off the second hour for Jay Haran. You had something for him. Was that, by the way, was that Girls on Film by Duran Duran? It was, sir. Okay. Very yeah. nice. Some early Duran Duran. It's no, a classic from the it 80s. It is. It is. Right. Just just to follow up on what we were talking about there before the break, I, I kind of have a theory that you, know, you talk about fighters who step away for a long period of time, come back when they shouldn't, but, you know, they're missing the game. They're missing everything around it. You know, you found a path through stunt work and things like that to – be able to take your MMA experience and apply it to something very successful, very lucrative, still very much in the spotlight, just a different medium. And I think I've seen sometimes with former fighters, whether it be that pursuit or even something like pro wrestling, maybe they get into something like that, that it's it's enough of what they're used to 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 satisfy them so they don't feel like I'm just totally removed from my identity, yeah. but at the same time I'm being realistic and I'm not, you know, risking getting knocked unconscious every night once I'm into my 40s. Do you think yeah. maybe that it in 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 the case of the entertainment pursuit that you've done, pro wrestling that can it kind of helps bridge that gap? Absolutely. Definitely. It gave me something else to, you know, get into and you know, change right. my energy towards that something I really liked that I didn't know. Yeah. And then I had to learn and, you know, learn take classes acting and learn how to film fight i mean again there's nothing the feeling you're gonna get fighting in yeah. front of twenty thousand people with your hand raised on pay-per-view or tv and there's nothing that compares to that feeling but you know i you know i get feelings that i don't get from that you know what i mean accomplishment and and um learning how to act and see myself in doing something that i didn't think i could do so yeah it's definitely you know, uh, and it's sad because some guys, not just fighters, there's other professional sports that they do it their whole life. And you, and you got to, you have to be totally into what you're doing to be the best or trying to be the best. And then when that's over, their retirement, they turn to, you know, uh, um, drinking or, or some type of stuff that, that hurts them. And then, you know, now they're depressed because yeah. they don't have a plan B. It's just, you know, I, I don't know. I was kind of. You know, it kind of fell on my lap, and, and I went with it. And thankfully, it worked out. You know, uh, for, it doesn't have to be your the, the path everybody goes, but, they, you know, us as pro athletes, we should kind of plan for something else because once that, that door closes, it's kind of closed. So you got to have something else going on. Yeah. Well, it definitely saves some money. <laughs> yeah. What was your greatest moment? Was it the KO of Jason High at Affliction? Like the, one of them. The biggest one, high. Definitely one of them. I yeah. mean, because there were so many elements in that light that night. But the one that you had I to warm up control. twice? Twice I had or three to warm times? Up twice. They told me, uh, they came into my dressing room and said the fight might not happen because they're pressed for TV time. So they might scrap the fight. We're going to get our win, win bonus. <laughs> so this was so many emotions I went through that night. And then for How'd you take that end, when they said it? But they said you'd get your win I bonus. just kind of breathed. And, we were like, uh, okay, I'm getting uh, paid. My manager at the time, which was Ken Pov, he was a little, you know what I mean? He was a bad motherfucker <laughs> <laughs> in both ways. But, yeah, like, he like ended a, up. Like a good weasel? He was a good weasel and bad weasel. Oh, but okay. I always think he was your a, weasel. He was my <laughs> weasel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but he was good, though, that night especially because he said, Jay, just, you know, he had my trainers, Ray Seffo, and them just deal with him. Keep them focused. I'm going to try my best to work on them still getting the fight done. And I knew what was going on, but they just kept me warm and kept me focused. Randy was in my corner, too. And, um, yeah, I just kept warming up, and then I would stop. And then, you know, we didn't know until a couple fights in and say, okay, your fight's back on. You're fighting after Fedor. After so they clean up the after, confetti yeah, that came yeah. down. Mm -hmm. so you what could take it that way or I was the real main event. All right, that's it. <laughs> Fedor Melianenko knocked out Andre Arlovsky yeah. in the main event yep. of Affliction. And, and then like, Yo, okay, you're on, you're on. So right. I'm running. So and he was then, like a post limb. Yeah, my rosary. I, I wear rosary beads right before my fight, kiss them and all that. I, I, I mean, I'm not superstitious, but I always wore them. And they, they broke right before the curtain we pull out. And we walked to the ring, and it broke. I'm like, oh, really? On top of everything that's going on, and Randy's Randy's trying to fix it, and, and you know what I mean? I'm just trying to stay loose. I'm just like, and he gets it. He puts it on. Somehow he, he rigged it together. He's like, you're good, and he put it on. And I, it went out, knocked this dude out in two minutes, and it was it was a great night.
Yeah, he knocked out Jason High yeah. that night. Look at the card that night. The card included Dan Lazon versus Bobby Green. Bobby yeah. Green still fights for the UFC. Dan Lazon, the younger brother of Joe Lazon, who also still fights for the UFC. Paul Beetle Puentello Belfort. versus uh, Kirill Sadilnikov. Linlin, right? Renato <laughs> Sobral versus mm -hmm. uh, Terry Sokaju. Matt Linlin versus Vitor Belfort. That was a crazy KO, too, man. Yeah. Josh Barnett versus Gilbert Ivel. Mm -hmm. Fedor Melianenko versus Andre Andrelovsky. And even on the undercard, uh, Hogerio Noguera defeated Vladimir Matyshenko. Oh, that's right. Yeah. But Jay did have to go through a two or three warm ups because yeah. of the uncertainty mm -hmm. uh, of the card. But Megadeth uh, played on that card. Megadeth remember was that? on the one before. That was always the one, the one with before. Sylvia. I tell you what, I always remember about this card though. When Fedor knocked out uh, Arlovsky, this is a MMA that was a flying knee, by the way. Yeah, this is an MMA junkie radio connection. So a couple of years later, you're having the junkie gathering, right? And there was a trivia night. So. Uh, everybody's paired up in the trivia, MMA trivia teams. And on our team, we had Ryan Couture, Randy's son. Yeah. So we come up with this question. And the question is, after Fedor knocked out uh, Andre Arlovsky at Affliction, he called out someone. Who did he call out? And Wait. We're, all, we're all sitting around. Wait, what was the question again? Uh, uh, after Andre Arlovsky got knocked out oh, by okay. Fedor, yeah, yeah. Fedor called out someone. It's a fight that didn't happen because they didn't do another pay-per-view. But who oh, did he I, call out? Okay, Randy. Yeah. So we're all sitting around <laughs> looking. Nobody's got the answer. Nobody's saying anything. And they go, okay, time's up. Uh, the answer is Randy Couture. And the whole team just looks at Ryan like, boy, some <laughs> some help you are. Yeah, here. some, some Thanks, insight buddy. he provided. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and if I'm had, not they mistaken. Had the poster. They had the poster. Yeah. The Wasn't poster. Trump at this one? Donald Trump? I, I think so. I don't know. I remember him being at one of them. Yeah. 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 He was there. Pretty tall dude, actually. But he was there. Uh, and you know who else was there? Yeah. <laughs> the attorney. Ty Tyson was at mine. He yeah. saw me knock out Jason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tyson was at mine because he was a big fan of Fedor. Mm. That's right. Yeah, Mike yeah. Tyson. That was incredible. What's the name of the guy that's serving time for protecting Trump? His personal attorney. Oh. He was the guy. He actually was around a lot. Oh, boy, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. Wait a minute. Uh, we're not talking about... The attorney that turned on him. Oh, Michael oh, oh, Cohen. Michael Cohen. Right? Yes, yes. He was Michael there, too. Cohen, yes. In really? fact, Michael Cohen was one of the guys that... that uh, yeah, he was real involved right. with that stuff, right? With he affliction. He was there, and yeah. Trump was right, there, really. but this was all, again, like, like 10, yeah. 12 years ago. And yeah. Nobody knew he was... He was doing The Apprentice, but nobody knew he was yeah. going to be uh, the eventual... Shout out President. affliction, man. Oof, yeah. They gave me a signing bonus to sign, like 50 Gs. I was like, yeah. really? Oh, yeah. They, so they said, hey, Jay, before we even talk contract, here's just the bonus? Signing. No, I was. They, that was part of my deal, but oh. they gave me a signing bonus, 50 grand. Boom. I'm like, wow. Yeah, That's baby. why a lot of people floated over there, huh? Yeah, it was that pissed off Dana White back then. It pissed off Dana White because a lot of his guys shame, went over there. And if you think about, like, Tim Sylvia, why he never had a great relationship with Dana White again, mm -hmm. that had a little bit of, yeah. of what of, of, of having to do with it as well. Um, off the air, we were talking a little bit about these discretionary bonuses. And here's the story I think that a lot of people know. When Rich Franklin fought, I think it was David uh, Loazu, mm -hmm. good friend of GSP, uh, I guess he broke his hand early in the fight or his foot or I can't remember what yeah. it was. But he went on to continue through the fight, and he was just one of their guys, you know. But I heard he got uh, a $300,000 bonus. And then Matt Hughes, when he beat Hoist Gracie, I heard he got a $1 million bonus. Wow. And then Tim Sylvia, when he beat Jeff Munson, he was expecting somewhere in that neighborhood, probably no lower than three and maybe a mil. And that's the fight when he fought Jeff Munson in Sacramento, I believe. And it just it was a snoozer a little bit. Yeah, I bit. remember that fight. And they gave him, I heard, 50 Gs. And he was really pissed. But there was everybody talks about this argument with big six foot eight, six foot nine Tim Sylvia. Mm -hmm. And Joe Silva was like 5'2", five 5'4", five you know. <laughs> who, who wasn't and much basically shorter Joe than Silva Jeff Munson. <laughs> was telling him something along the line of, like, basically your fight sucked, man. This yeah. is all you're going to get. Like, yeah. But back then they right. would write these bonuses – Sometimes on the spot, or you got it in the mail, and uh, and but I, I think I think part, some of it also was residual from you know other stuff that maybe yeah. Tim Sylvia did. I don't know if he was difficult or whatever behind the scenes. He's the, he was one of the OGs as wearing as far as like wearing the belt around. Everybody sees Colby yeah. Covington yeah. with the belt, but Tim <laughs> Sylvia used to do that back in the day. 
What is no- nostalgic times, huh? Like in the club with it. Yeah. 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 I liked it back then, too, because the UFC, the fights were only on like one month, so you get more excited about mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Now they're on every I, week. I always you know I, mean? I always think it's still so funny to go back. You know, I'll watch old fights like uh, on Fight Pass, stuff like that, and it's, it's – uh, it, it's so jarring to hear Mike Goldberg at the end of some of those old pay-per-views go, you know, okay, we'll see you in two months, you know, <laughs> right? whenever really? the next broadcast is, <laughs> wow. yeah. And now it's like every, pretty much yeah. every week. Yeah. Do you yeah. still cool keep up too. with it? Um, with the sport? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm all around it. I'm still, you know, it's still my life. I got, I, the gym, there's got so many guys that fighting. No, but so like you watched Sacramento, party. UFC Sacramento last weekend? With well, the, I don't the catch card? all of them because okay. I'm always traveling. But, you know, I'll definitely make it a point if there's a fight I want to see. Like, uh, um, you know, if there's a fight I really want to see that's a good matchup, I'll make it a point to watch it. But I follow everything. I got you guys, MMA Junkie, um, MMA Weekly, uh, UFC. I, yeah. I get the play-by-plays. I get the highlights. So, I mean, even if I'm on the road, I see it. All right. That I'm was still a cool a fan, story yeah. that you shared about – Affliction, and I love going old school with fighters when they come in here. Yeah. So I'm just gonna tell you the <laughs> name of a fight, and if okay. there's something that stands out, that's just a funny story. It was bizarre, you know. It, maybe it took you 26 hours to get there. They had to turn the plane around. Yeah. That was a un- informal weigh-ins. I don't know anything that jumps out at you. Let me know, okay? Keith Plate, Reality Fighting Four, Jermaine Johnson, Ring of Combat Five, Fernando Munoz. Ring of Jesus Combat Christ. Six. These were your early fights. Yeah. I don't any, s- any memories there? Man, that was too early, bro. I, was, I don't remember. <laughs> Did you have a big afro or anything? Nah, or nah nothing? that was quick fights. Okay. So. Uh, Fabio uh, Olanda. Bellator tournament, tournament. I got some stories for that. That was okay, probably one of the hardest that. things I've done because every Every 30 days, right? Yeah, and it was like the semifinals. I fought a tough guy. Anthony Lapsley. That was a quick fight. I choked uh, him out. But I, I was at that fight in Lamar. Brent Weedman. I he was a sleeper. That was I in had, Newkirk, I Oklahoma. What happened? I was super c- going in like uh, I'm gonna smash this guy, and he dropped me with a left hook from. I mean, he threw it from left field, bro. I was on. I fell. I get back, scramble back up. I come down to do a um um. He's uh, like like ground like and pound. His, yeah, ground and pound. I'm coming down with a right hand. He up kicks me, <laughs> bro. Double knockout. I'm like, what the hell's going on? I don't even remember the rest of the fight. So, uh-huh. Let's bring I your mic back fight. up a little. Yeah, I ended up winning the fight. Felt great doing things. Well, not felt great because I don't remember. But I was doing. I look at the replay. I'm doing things I like. Shit. I don't instinct even remember. Stuff, instinct. Right? All yeah. instinct. Jumping off the cage. Throwing <laughs> straight rights. It was incredible. Combinations. But anyway. After that, I'm like, yo. I'm t- I, was, I had a concussion. A broken nose. My teeth on the bottom were loose. I just was totally Damn. messed up. Yeah, I was totally messed up. And I was like, um, um, Bjorn, can I get a couple extra weeks? I'm, I'm fucked up, dude. Like, <laughs> Sorry like, to laugh, dude. Yeah. Okay. He's like, nope. If you don't fight, we're putting in um, the guy you just beat because we have a TV schedule to keep. It was on right. MTV2 back then. And you'd be meeting Rick Hahn for the tournament final. Rick Hahn. Okay. Tough guy, undefeated, judo Olympian. And I'm like half – you know what I mean? My head spinning off my, my head, my <laughs> neck every day. I couldn't even spar. I would go to the gym. The first day I remember, the first sparring session I had, because you're right back in camp oh. the next week. Frank Trigg. I'm sparring Frank Trigg. Punches me with a jab to my nose. Rebroke my, my nose to the right again. Like, I just had it set. It got off. <laughs> it was broken again. My nose is hanging off my face again. So, a concussion, broken nose. So, I didn't spar. Leading up until the final fight because I called Bjorn. I was trying to get an extra time. That didn't happen. He's like, you know, and that's the the most of the money was they set up that whole structure oh, that's for right. the final. You get the it's most like of the win bonus. 25, 25, yeah, 75. Yeah, 75 yeah. with sponsors like 150, whatever it was. So that was the money fight. I'm like, I got to do it. So I just drilled. I was with Ray. We just did Holland drills back and forth. And... Dude, going into the fight, the day before the the weigh-ins, I had a bad weight cut. I ended up fainting, 
<laughs> going in and out of the sauna. I'm, wa I'm waking up on the ground and still concussed. So I'm thinking that has something to do with it. But I'm like, dude, I'm twisted. I didn't even tell the trainers at the time that that I was so, you know, they knew I had a little bit of a concussion and broken nose, but I didn't tell them I fainted. So I just kept that under the wraps. Jeez, Get dang. into the fight. I'm this just is like, crazy. this is it. And I felt so, but I it was weird because I felt sharp that fight. Like, I just felt like everything slowed once, down. Once you were rehydrated. Once I was okay. rehydrated, yeah. I was rehydrated. I got into the fight, and I left all that stuff out of my mind, and I felt pretty good. But, yeah, that was one of the That's hardest things I've done was that there. Bellator tournament from the semis to the finals. That and, sounds um, awful. Yeah. <laughs> it does. <laughs> I mean, and I was giggling, and I didn't mean to giggle because business. You, you're a funny storyteller, but he's just started off <laughs> yeah. like, yo, Bjorn, I'm <laughs> fucked up, man. You know, like, yeah, <laughs> straight up. I was like, bro, yeah, give me Bjorn, like I'm another two weeks, up. dude. Well, and you just put that in like, you just put that in like a normal person's perspective. Like, if they're fainting, passing out, concussed, they're thinking things like, okay, I need to call in sick to work. Yeah. I need to go to the doctor. The last thing anybody's Reset going is. Reset my teeth. Yeah. The yeah. last thing anybody's thinking is, you know, I should probably go ahead and get in a fight in two weeks, <laughs> right? <laughs> Against the Judo uh, Olympian. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's the part of the game, man. But a lot of guys going injured it's funny because what you were thinking was the money i mean uh, granted you were gonna get you're gonna be a tournament finalist and the with an opportunity shot, to fight and all that but too much it's funny how this sport can it's like a little carrot that they dangle right yeah. that little payday and a lot of fighters the reason they don't want to pull out or when they fought they just they want you to get somebody in there is mm -hmm. because they also just want to get paid like you're probably already pre-spending that money, right? Like, absolutely. You know, like you a know car us as fighters, you, yeah, you live off your last, you know, your last uh, check. You know what I mean? Unless, you know, the IFL had a pretty good structure. They would give you salary every month. We were getting like twenty five hundred, three thousand, which would help with the bills. But, you know, if you're now, uh, you get good paydays, yeah. But if you don't budget your money right, I mean, you know, they kind of. Uh, nixed away with the sponsors you know guys used to make a living off the sponsors every month True. monthly sponsors I don't know the structure now with that I know they get paid on the certain amount of fights they have I don't know some guys still have big sponsors that they might take care of them but majority don't so well, let me ask you a question here after you're done fighting mm -hmm. you get back to the locker room and the promotion obviously gives you your checks there yeah how soon before the coaches, the managers start kind of like, so, uh, you know, like when they start getting their cut, like, do they, is there a, like a 48 hour grace period yeah. where they don't bug you or do they start <laughs> looking at you or uh, anything? I mean, like if you got when, what does people, all that happen where you have depends. to break everyone I don't off? know everybody's situation. I always had good people around me. Yeah. So they wouldn't, they know, you know, if you were a good dude, you, you're not going to stiff anybody. You know what I mean? If you just got, you know, your ass beat out there, nobody's going to be, unless they're a, jerk off hey man i need my money you know what i mean which yeah they do they the sport has jerk off yeah but i mean and they do need their money because they put in a whole camp with you and trained right. you or a manager did your deal whatever but you don't just do that after a guy is coming back with his fucking teeth hanging out of his mouth or his nose broken and he's right. concussed again i don't know everybody's situation i always had good people around me i would make a point to have good people around me and 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 they know they would get paid that would be my point. The week, like within a week. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. As soon as we get situated back home, I'll cut you a check. You don't do it right then and there. You know what right, I mean? Right, Nobody's. Right. I mean, there's probably some people that because there is some snakes in the business. You already know, but but um, you know, I've you again for these young fighters, put good people around you. Yeah. If if it's not working, and you feel like they're in it for the wrong reasons. Don't be afraid to cut somebody off and go somewhere else. If that camp is working, go somewhere else. Get good energy because you're the one that's getting in that cage. You're the ones getting that damage at the end of the day. You know, if you're losing, they're going to be another guy they're going to go to and start training them. So do what's best for you. It's you're the one that's taking that damage. Try to have good people around you. And it takes time. You know, you got to find somebody you mesh with, you train with. That you, you want to be around, that their vibe is right for you. You know, again, that's my advice to the young guys. Find people that are good around you, have your best intention, that want to build you up, not just throw you to wolves just to get a check off you. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of that too. You never know somebody's intention. It's it's money in this business. So 
they want to get their little money they got a guy they're gonna feed you to the wolves you need to be built up you know you need a guy to tell your trainer nah you're not ready yet keep training let's learn more you know guide you you know that's the best way this sport has rude people in it and very tacky people in it mm. you know what i mean because absolutely you're right like you know, like if I was one of his coaches, I would just trust. I probably wouldn't even be in the relationship of a fighter coach if I already didn't know that that's a good guy. So yeah. basically, I can't pre-spend the money, and I would just wait for him. But I was just wondering, like, if it was. Uh, I'm sure if, it happens. If the coaches are like on Monday, you know. Or, Absolutely, or, or and and so and, and there is. I feel for some coaches that don't get paid. There's some fucking piece of shit fighters. Oh shit! The money. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. Right. I'm, there's some piece of shit fighters that don't pay their coaches at all. I, yeah, there's some of that too. Some fighters are pieces of shit. Mm. Yo, that guy is training you. He might have a family, a kid, and he takes his time to sweat. Well, what there. fighter thinks that the coach shouldn't get paid? I don't. But I'm not. I, there's no particular no somebody in my head. Yeah. But I've known yeah. over the years. I've been in this game a Damn. long time. There are some guys that don't feel like they should pay a trainer. That's bull. That's totally bull. Bullshit. Mm -hmm. I see both sides too. You know, if a guy's in there taking his time, holding pads for you, breaking his elbows, that shit, you know, you get tendonitis from holding pads so much. You know, getting holding kick shields and wrestling with you and you're dirty sweating on him. You know what I mean? You're beating his ass um, right before a fight. You know, the guy back there with you, the trainer, is the one getting hit in the head too because they're not holding back a guy that's about to go into. A fight. Mm -hmm. They're not. They they're getting caught. Trust me, a couple of times. Oh my bad. Oh, it's all good. So, I understand that too. Mm -hmm. And there is guys that don't take care of their trainers. But again, that's all back to you have to find you know um, people that are good for you around you. Trainers too. You can't just be training just a guy and he's gonna fuck you over too. It goes for them too. You gotta find somebody you could kind of build that listens and is gonna show up on time and not waste your time and come to training sessions and be all drunk out in the club. I'm a fighter, you know what I mean? For the wrong reasons. Why are you gonna spend time on that guy? Take a guy over here that's gonna listen and 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 come to training on time and go out there and bust his ass for you and has heart. Never give up and you know all those elements. That's the guy you wanna you know put your energy in. Right, man. Good stuff behind the scenes here from Jay Harong. You got one more segment in you? Absolutely. All right, we got to take a break. It's MMA Junkie Radio on Fight Nation Channel 156. When we come back, we'll do a little bit of these Twitter beefs that are out there. Start off <laughs> with John Jones and Corey Anderson.
Now is the time to start preparing for fantasy football season by listening to Fantasy Sports Radio. Be a fan of, uh, fantasy football champion by learning from the best analysts, including the guru, John Hansen, Pro Football Focus, and the football diehards. Here at Player Ranking Strategies and pick, by ki- uh, pick Coverage of Fantasy Football Expert Drafts. So you know how to build a winning team. Listen to Fantasy Sports Radio on Series 210 XM87. All right, Jay Haran, one of my favorite uh, in-studio guests that we have because he's always a kind of like an open book. And he just started to go on something that I think will be very interesting for any hardcore fan out there. So once again, we're just going to give the little Twitter beef segment a push <laughs> <laughs> towards, <laughs> towards later in the hour. Twitter fingers. Are, are you about to tell me, because we just kind of rehashed a little bit during the break, how mm-hmm. difficult these tournaments were. And I told Absolutely. you we would have Bjorn on, and a, a lot of them didn't fall apart. Yeah. But little did we know that a lot of you are probably just going in there, like you said, Ooh. fucked up. Yeah, like they absolutely. stapled you together, or yeah. glued you together, or I taped really you together. I really feel like the, Go the ahead tournaments in one night are probably more doable than the tournaments every thirty days, because all those injuries you have settle in, right? And then you're back in camp that Monday. You know what I mean? So you're gotcha. walking around half-assed, like, oh, my fucking, my nose is fucking falling off my face, my jaw hurts, my teeth are loose. Shit, I got a concussion, and now I got a spar again. I come back in camp. You started Where to it? say it, and I was like, I was about to say he's crazy, and then I go, no, wait a minute, he makes sense. You're right, because <laughs> even though you do, there is a come down. You know, there's a couple hours on yeah. those on those same night tournaments, but it is all within the same night. Dude, and, you know, yeah, you, you might be swollen, but and, and it's the other, all you one know, night. the other guy's probably in the same boat. Absolutely, you know what yeah, I mean. Whereas the there. thirty days, you do yeah. need to decompress and rest your mind, rest your body. Like, but you're back in camp Monday. You're back in camp. <laughs> you're and setting up your sparring. <laughs> you're a lifelong wrestler, so you shouldn't have been passing out. You know how to do this, but it was your probably your body just never recovered. Yeah, never recovered. I mean, it's just. You know, again, the last fight I did in the finals, I didn't spar the whole few weeks that I had to prepare for that fight. So I felt pretty decent, you know. But, again, going back, like, all those injuries settle in right after your fight. So it's like your body wants to repair itself, but you're already back in camp. So you're already beating it up again, you know, rather than just a one-night uh, tournament. I feel that's a little better, just more convenient anyway. I mean, so we're all fucking, we're all clashing like two fucking rams, right? Mm-hmm. There's no convenient way when you out there throwing shin to shin or shin to fucking head and punches to the face with four ounce gloves. But again, I mean, I just think it's more convenient one night. So after you just go rest up for a couple of weeks and, you know, now you're back. Rather PFL's kind of doing something similar now that you think about yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Th- I think they're going hey, about listen, every six weeks. But guess what, though? That's a mil. million dollars. Million dollars <laughs> That's a game. million dollars. That's a little boy. Hey, I got a concussion, Ray, but uh, I'm good. I'm good to go. What's the schedule? Yeah, I'm fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> we, we, let's go. <laughs> That's a mill at the end of that. That's the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow you want. Are you happy for those guys? I'm very happy. Yeah. That's incredible. That's great. I mean, super happy for everybody involved, especially Ray. You know, he worked hard to get, um, you know, he raised a fighter at yeah. heart. So he has, you know, a best interest for a fighter. You know, if this was around when I that, you know, when I was contemplating retirement, that's something I might want wanted to have, want to pursue, you know, because it's a, that's big money at the end of uh, the tournament, you know. Mm-hmm. They, they do great. the one night. That, that's a tough season. They'll it fight is. two times, six weeks apart, sometimes four weeks apart. Then they take a, a tiny break, not that big of a break, but a little bit of a break, like two yeah. months. And then they have the first playoff run where it's two fights in one night. Yep. Then you come back for the final. Yeah. So that, that mill is well earned. It well earned, but it's still it's still it's money that you know it's if you know how to work that money, it's life changing money. You know, you could buy a house. You know what I mean? If if a guy doesn't come up with money, and you could you could do something with that. You could invest a little bit. You know. You know, you you could blow it too. Don't get me wrong, but but it's decent money. It's mm-hmm. you know, I fought when I fought Bellator. What I make on the three fights in 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 thirty days each was one seventy, maybe if that with sponsors. I mean, <laughs> Jesus Christ, trainers, your lifestyle, your your your, your my mortgage, my just my. I had a, a, a nutritionist, like you know what I mean. I was spending money on everything just to stay my body, my body right. So it's it's expensive. What was it like then when Extreme Couture was blowing up with Forrest had a belt, Randy had a belt, you pile all these guys were just 
like uber famous oh, around town the, the golden what, what, era what was baby. it like in <laughs> here on the strip did you guys get treated pretty pretty well like oh, rock yeah. stars too you have any all stories vegas. From those? vegas always treated mma fighters like well before because yeah. we didn't have raiders we didn't have a professional team then mm -hmm. so the you the fighters that lived here were like th your professional athletes from las vegas so they you know you'd go to the club they take care of you you know everybody knows who you are it's, it was great it was the golden era i feel when i first moved here i mean you know i first moved i went to j set and first guys i see in the in the in the gym was uh Tito Ortiz was there, Matt Hughes was there, Chuck Liddell was there a couple of days later. I mean, this is, you know. Were the Fertitas and Dana White training over there when you were there? I think so. I didn't see them, but yeah. But yeah. They, they had their office too, and, and Dana had a gym downstairs from his office at, around the same time I, I moved here as well, 2004. Mm -hmm. And he had a gym right down there, a nice little private boxing gym. It was it was dope. Why did you only get one? Oh, no, I guess you got two. You got two fights in the UFC, sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it was just like the roster Timing wasn't wise, as deep, right? I, yeah, I was. Uh, I got a in. fight UFC, and then I, they wanted me back a few times, or a contract was in place. But I got better offers, man. I got, you know, I went with Affliction one time. I got the fifty thousand dollars signing bonus. Was, was the great. IFL run fun? IFL run was fun. I was on salary. You know, it just those times in my life that that time in my life it just made sense to go in that direction strike force good memories there. strike force great memories i had a signing bonus with them too i had a t-shirt deal in place and i was on the ea sports game at the same time so it was just, i was getting checks from a couple different um places when i was signing you know so looking back dude money, you had money was was ufc uh, bell torn strike force that's rare honestly mm -hmm. and then throw in fighting for affliction yeah. IFL, WC. Uh, Titan, Titan still around. You, you yeah. do have a WEC fight. Uh, WC. I fought every organization. OG. You even <laughs> fought at Lockdown in Paradise 1 against hey, Ronald Hawaii. Machine Gun. Ronald Jun. Old Jun, vet yeah. in the game, too. So you had, to, you had to beat a Hawaiian in Hawaii. I'll beat a Hawaiian about. I got a belt for that, too. Yeah. Yeah. Do you fun. still have it? I think so, somewhere. Yeah. 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 Lockdown in Paradise. Look through all my stuff I have. I got some old gloves and stuff. But yeah, man. Again, you know, I I'm content with my career. Fought a lot of great fighters. Uh, won the title in um, um, IFL. Um, and a title defense too, you had right. Title defense. I won the Bellator tournament, so I did some things. Could I have done more? Yeah, I feel like my potential. I didn't never got to where I wanted to be, you know, on the level of my potential. But I'm totally content, and that's when I retired and I thought about it. I took some time to think about it. And I was content, you know. And then again, like we said earlier, I found something else that filled that void, and I was passionate about, which I'm still doing now. Which is with who, um, who else is doing stunt work? So there's you, Pyle Trick, doing stunt. Piles, Piles in Hawaii right now, do working on Magnum PI. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He just sent me a video of him going through a window. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Have you been lit on fire? I've been lit on fire, full fire burn. That's crazy. crazy or what? That shit was yeah. nuts, bro. That shit felt like just as nerve wracking as going into a fight. Yeah. My stomach was bubbling, dude. And then when they lit me up, I was like, it's gel. It wasn't a suit. Like some people say, oh, you got lit on fire. You had a suit on? No. I have this gel on, which is like a new technology gel. The fire burns on top of the gel. Jeez. But you only have a certain amount of time before it gets through the gel to your skin. So you got to do the scene. Yeah, you got to have good people around you, uh, too, that, yeah. that know what's up. Like, you know, have some signs. Hey, man, <laughs> come on, get me, get this shit. You know what I mean? Fire extinguishes me, me out. Right. But, they uh, gel your whole body? or just Yeah, gel your whole body. The clothes the clothes get gelled. Gel we can't see that on TV? They, they block all no, that? No, I got it. I can show you. No, I know. But, like, when I'm watching television and I see the fire scene, am I able to pick up on no, the gel? No, or, the no? gel is just like it's a clear gel. So okay. You can't see anything. Well, that's got to be worse than trusting a referee in a fight, trusting the yes. guy that's got to put you out. Right? Thankfully, I had a guy that works on fire yeah. burns for 30 years. But the craziest thing about it, dude, I, so I had gel on my face. When they lit me up, I was looking through the flames. Whoa. I mean, the flames were over my face, and I was looking through the flames. And I'll show you a picture. It was, so it it's was not, crazy. It's not burning you, but can you feel the heat? I felt the heat. Even when they put me out, the whole night, my body temperature was up. There's wow. little tiny spots. I had hot spots. Like, it was getting through a little bit. 
Like, did you know that? Did they tell you that that might happen? Yeah, they said, you know, they, there was all types. Of, we had a uh, um, safety meeting. Like, yo, you know, do this, do that. If something goes wrong, we're going to throw you in the, um, bring out the extinguishers, bring out the water. So, yeah, they had a bunch of safety out there and everything. So, wow. it was, it's serious. Like, I mean, you know, I, this stunt world is serious stuff. It's not like a fight. A fight, you go in, yeah, you might get knocked out. You might break something. You know, your nose, your jaw. Yeah, it's dangerous. It's definitely damage on your body. But listen, if something goes wrong on a film set in a movie and it goes horribly wrong, you done. Yeah. Like, they ain't know if you want some high fall and you hit the wrong thing and you hit the ground, sayonara. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I mean, sad to say, but yeah, it's it's not. You can't have a mistake. So what are your scariest stunts? This sounds like one. What else? Fire burn. I've done a 60-foot fall. You know, like, a, what like they have jump that out a window with two other guys. Sixty feet, sixty like feet. the top of man. Like, all right, and so and out of window. What did you land on? Like the boxes. air mattress. Boxes. Boxes. Yeah. That like, breaks the fall. Yeah. Boxes. Like, uh, like, uh, like ten, four or five rows of boxes, and there's some pads in in between it. But it's still like after I had to get a massage, it was still stiff. My neck was <laughs> like, oh shit. But I went out with three guys, so that thing I was just worried about. My man, like crushing you, because I was the first guy out. And I was just worried about two dudes falling on top of me. Oh, yeah. I'm like, yo, bro, make sure you go that way. Like, I'm going to go this way. You and go what that was way. the scene? Like a fight scene and someone throws you Yeah, it was like out? they were chasing me and I jump out a and window yeah. and they jump out after me. It was on lethal weapon. And you knew exactly where you were headed. Yeah, a lot of, you know, we pra we rehearsed it. You know, again, these guys. The, but uh, you don't rehearse the jump, right? No. You just no. rehearse where? Rehearse cameras. Yeah. I mean, if you're put in that position, you know. You 60 yeah, or 60, 60 stories. I'm, I'm waiting to hear. 60 story. feet. Just not okay. 60 I, stories. I'm shit. waiting to hear. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, you crazy? That sounds like I'll boxes. be like, yo, Jay, you want to jump 60 stories? I'm good, bro. <laughs> I'm uh, behind on that. Get up real super high fall, dude, for that one. So 60 feet would be about six stories. I, I'm right. waiting to hear one aspect of Jay's life that I would want to do. You know what I mean? Like, I know. Do you, do you ever go to the True. dog park or anything? <laughs> yeah, like, okay, I, I could do that. <laughs> I'm boring. The rest of it, I'm like, a no, no, no. no. My, my girl, I'm boring. When I'm home, I don't want to do nothing, man. I got so much action in my life, I'm cool. I always want to lay on the couch and play with my dog. I could handle that. So you, you jumped out. You've been burnt. Uh, I've jumped what, out. I've been burnt. Car hits. Uh um, helicopter on a Geico commercial. I was on the side of the helicopter. The Geico commercial for real? Yeah. Oh, yeah okay. I was on a, it's the one where it's a, called the spy commercial where the guy's on the phone. He's like, hey, uh, um, his mom's like, what are you doing playing Zumba? And it looks like it's a movie. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes it's a Geico commercial. They uh -huh. spend so much money, Geico, on these commercials. But that was just, I was on the side of the helicopter in a harness. And, um, yeah, it's one of those things. Right before the guy gives uh, me a knife and the other guy a knife that we were both on, he says, so if it's emergency landing, you guys got to cut yourselves out. And he has to cut you out because I can't reach behind my Whoa. back and I have to cut him out. So it's like, you know what I mean? Because we can't reach our own. Yeah. What? Okay, let me make sure I understand that. So they're saying that we're going to pull you up in the helicopter and that's going to involve the stunt and everything, but but totally separate of any of that, if there's a problem with the helicopter... Exactly, yeah. Cause you've I mean, got to cut yeah, yourself. You don't, yeah, there's no way to get... You know what I mean? What yeah. if something mechanically right, happened? Right, right. But the pilot was great. He was, uh, he's was he been in so many stunt stuff with helicopter. He was incredible. I mean, we were hovering out there, yeah. and that was like the most scariest thing for me. I mean, the funny story is with the, with the pilot... He was like, yeah, I knew when you started relaxing because I could see when your fingers, because <laughs> I had a grip, a death grip on the side of the helicopter and my fingers at the tips were all purple. And he's like, yeah, I knew when you were relaxed because your fingers, I didn't see purple anymore in your fingers. <laughs> well, YouTube's got everything. So let's take a quick break. YouTube's got everything. I want to find this. Yeah, this it's sounds a quick so pretty edit when they put it in. But yeah, you could see it. I jump off the side of the helicopter and it's, it's right. pretty cool. We were way up in the I remember which LA. one you're talking about. Yeah. All right. You're listening to MMA Junkie Radio on Fight Nation channel 156 stay close we will be right back
Are you guys into these Twitter beefs? Uh, do depends. Think, do you think in a way that it's kind of like uh, early fight hype? So, <laughs> you know, if it builds the fight, puts more money in the fighters' pockets, brings more people to the arena. Why not? More pay-per-views get sold in the end. Like, is it is it all right? Or, I, or I do you just scroll past it? I don't mind it if it's creative. But sometimes if it's uh, not very creative, then it can actually diminish my interest because then I'm too focused on well, these guys aren't very good at this. Mm -hmm. But if they're good at it, yeah. yeah. John Jones says, Anthony Smith in a recent interview, quote, I've said it over and over and over again. I'm coming and there's no one who's going to stop me. And then he's got some emojis there. Kind of like, hmm. Like, he's questioning it. Then he says, breaking news, Corey Anderson verbally attacks John Jones about his past. Uh, why does these guys have to talk smack before taking their L? And then after the fight, I go on with good sportsmanship and say nice things about it. It's getting old. Who's that? John Jones, Jones is oh. saying that, yeah. Um I think those guys are just trying to poke the bear. Yeah, you, know, you to gotta. Get the I fight. mean, they're trying to. Yeah, I mean, that's the gen, that's the era we're in. I mean, you gotta. If they're not giving you the fight, you gotta try to get out there and, and sell it to make it happen. Get under somebody's skin. Hey, man. Hey, do what you gotta do. Again, you just short window. If you're trying, like, like you're trying to get in there and get that money and get those big fights, whatever it takes. You can't sit around and wait, right? Mm -hmm. Anthony Smith says back to him, oh, now we're making fun of people? You better check yourself, tough guy. Don't forget, <laughs> I'm the guy that made you almost likable. I'll quickly be the guy to change that if you keep it up. Also, you owe me a fucking drink, and I don't forget, Modelo, 12-ounce bottle, chilled. These are not very creative. <laughs> but when uh, Chael Sonnen... Uh, leading up to the fight he had uh, with John Jones, ran that special at the pizza restaurant that he invested in where it was like take out a uh, pizza and a six-pack of wow. beer. Yeah. And it was like the John Jones DUI special. That's oh, creative. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, Chels, yeah. you can't mess yeah. with Chels. No, you he's can't. Too, he's, too, uh, he's too creative. Yeah. Man. He I, I hate funny. to keep going back to Ben, but did, did he run smack at you when you yeah. guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wayans, I mean. I can't remember if that's more of a phenomenon of him just in the UFC yeah, he, or if he no, always he's did. He's been that way. He's been that way. He's always talked smack. He talked smack when we fought. I mean, we were at the Wayans talking smack to each other. It's part of the game. I mean, it, that's just what it is. Mm -hmm. I never got too deep into it, but I wouldn't shy away from it. But, you know, it's it's if it sells fights and, you know, guys are going to fight anyway at the end of the camp. At the day they're going to fight, they're going to fight anyway. Hey, man. I'm always fascinated when I hear that fighters have had in-fight conversations with other fighters. Yeah. Have you ever does, have you ever had any kind of strange conversation like that or anything uh, that jumps to mind? Not, not that jumps to mind. I'm sure I said probably a few things to somebody during a fight but and or vice versa. Right. But it happens, you know, especially in uh, – you know, in the heat of the moment, I've known Diaz. They always oh, fucking yeah. talking smack. And, yeah. You know, they have fun with it. It's it's uh they're so comfortable in there. So, I mean, it's not a game changer unless somebody throws a right hand and hits you while your mouth's open and breaks your jaw. <laughs> right. <laughs> Frank, Keep Frank, mouth shut, right? Frank told me. Frank M Mir told me uh, that in his fight with Mirko Krokop, if you watch, there's a point where he, he's on the ground. Frank's back is on the mat, and he's lets Mirko know that one of his testicles has come out of the cup. Wow. And really? And that uh, <laughs> Crocot gives him a second to readjust it and get it back in there. Damn. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> and it's an odd thing to come up in conversation yeah. during a fight, but yeah. <laughs> right. Wow. Hey, hold on. My nut's yeah. out. Give me just, a second. <laughs> just to let you know, I've had a major wardrobe malfunction. And Crocop let him put it back yeah. in. <laughs> hey, Crocop's old school <laughs> Croatian dude. He's like, yeah, put that thing away. I don't want that thing touching me. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of that, actually, um, when Cejudo won, we all thought it was a little unusual that he called out, I think, um, Cruz, in Dillashaw, Faber. and Faber, yeah, right? Yeah. At the time, Faber did have the fight set. But, look, I'm not, I don't want to be mean, but I, I don't know that a lot of people expected that outcome. Maybe they expected him to win, but just mm. that was an emphatic win. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so now Faber said, hey, you know, you called me out, and that's what Faber does. He looks for big fights, you know what I mean? Now, he'd be jumping the queue because, remember, there's Peter Yan and Aljamain Sterling yeah. and other uh, Bantamweights that, that are very deserving. But – uh, I mean, look, he got the attention of Cejudo. Cejudo calls Faber a corn-rolled 
princess, which he probably <laughs> would say cornrow princess. And uh, but he tells him if you want a title shot, you got to bend the knee to triple C. Uh, so I guess that to, to, be to beg for the title shot, maybe I don't know. Oh, wow. Favor writes him back. The cringe is real. You can triple C D's nuts <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> swinging over your face yeah. while you're laying on the canvas. So that's why I said, ironically, the balls are coming to yeah. play. Yeah, here we go. Just teabag. I'm going to hit you with the teabag at the end of the fight. Ba bang. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a pretty good one there. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I don't, like know, I don't said, know if it's going to be enough to get him the shot. It kind of gets it's dumb sometimes, but sometimes it's good. It's entertainment. Mm -hmm. I don't think it should not be done. I mean, it's a fight at the end of the day. Guys get emotional, you know. It's going to happen. So, I mean, as long as you don't, you know, fight outside of it and then ruin your payday and all that, whatever, it's all part of the game. You guys are very nice to Goz and I. You allow us to go in the Extreme Couture Gym. So, usually what we see stays with us. Yeah. Um, every once in a while, I'll share a story that I don't think in any way damages any any. Anything that's happening. Yeah. But here's one that I shared with the with the audience about two months ago. You'll probably remember this. Um, I think it was small glove day. Okay. No, big glove day. Yeah. And all of a sudden, a little f skirmish breaks out. And I guess one of the foreigner kids had only small gloves. Yeah. And so the fight kind of broke out. And then yeah. the guy with the big gloves goes, what the hell? And started putting it on the other guy. And... Uh -huh. Eric's trying to get control. Eric Nixick, the GM, one of the coaches, trying to get control of it. But then Jay goes, hey, come here. What the hell are you doing? You know what I mean? Yeah. And the kid kind of like I think realizes, oh, boy, I'm in trouble. He starts walking away. But you told him, hey, come here. I'm talking to you. <laughs> and the reason I'm saying all this, not to embarrass the dude. I don't even yeah. know his name or yeah. anything. But it's pretty cool, Jay, how you still are a leader in the gym. Absolutely. And you wanted to just basically figure out what happened. You, yeah, and well, you told him what he did was wrong. We had a big glove day, and a guy comes out with little gloves, and I don't know why the guy that was sparring with him didn't tell him, no, it's big glove day. And this one of the guys actually got cut. You know what I mean? Yeah. We don't spar. You're not out all out punching 100% with the little gloves. That's just right. asinine to do that. I don't know if anybody still does that, but you can't. That's big glove day, headgear. You should be greased up, especially if you have a fight coming up. Right. So, yeah, that situation, I'm like, what the hell's going on? He's not really listening. They keep going at it. So, yeah, I step in. You know, that's my gym, bro. I feel like that's my home. I, I was one of the guys that first uh, opened the gym up with Randy. Right. You know? I remember I was that. one of the guys on the team that with Randy Gray and Tyson and Pyle. Yeah. yeah, all the guys. So, so yeah, I feel like, you know, it's a, you I love should it. have some leaders in the gym. And I love seeing when Rick uh, – sorry, Eric, once in a while – We'll make everyone stay a little bit extra because he wanted a little bit more enthusiasm or a little bit more intensity. Mm -hmm. And what's cool is you'll watch the leaders like Ray and Jay, and they'll also take the punishment with the other guys. Mm, so absolutely. I know they're like, well, wait a minute. We didn't do it, but we got to set the example. So yeah. they'll be doing those like upside-down push-ups, which I don't know what the hell you call that. But yeah. uh, Great energy, great gym. I mean, again, that's what I go back to earlier saying. You know, for the young guys, try to put good people around you. Try to get in, you know, people with like like minds as yourself and try to get good energy because it's a rough, rough game. And the better people you have around you, the more chance you have of succeeding with, you know, your trainers as well. I'm, 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 I understand the trainer's point of view, too. You can't just train anybody and not get stiffed. And, you know, you got a household to feed and you're spending all this time at the gym and trying to help build fighters. So it's vice versa. You need to have good people, good fighters, and you need to have good trainers. And when that happens, you know, sky's the limit. You get guys that, you know, that are doing great things. And, again, some trainers and some fighters, they don't mesh together. Yeah. That's okay. That doesn't mean either of them are bad people. It's just that, that their energies don't mix. F try something else. Try somebody else. Try a new camp. Try training different fighters. There will be people out there that have the same mind frame as you. So not everybody's bad. and not yeah. It's not just every single fighter or every single trainer. It's just some guys mesh well together. Who's punched you the, the hardest in practice? <laughs> wow. I don't know. I have, we used to do maybe the, just the trick jabs. One you'll wars remember, right? Back in the day, I mean, man, I sparred everybody. Vanderlei Silva back in the day. Vito Belfort. I mean, I've sparred so many guys. I, Did you ever mix it I up with Kimbo? Kimbo was there for a while. Yeah, right? Kimbo a little bit. You know, I don't think those. He was trying to like 
go, you know, throw bombs on me. But, I mean, I've been hit, stung by some. Give me a memorable really leg kick where you go like, whoa, man, kick, that stung. I, man, bro, you know how many sparring sessions and fights I've had? I can't pick out one thing just right off the top. Okay. Of I'm trying to think. Um, man. A body uh, shot? Same thing? Body shot. Uh, I mean, definitely uh, Gil Martinez when he was uh, – uh, training a lot of fighters gyms he used to bring some boxes over and they were man i used to hate sparring those guys they were so fast and and ripped the body you know yeah. they definitely ripped the body anthony tabidi he's doing great right now he's like a uh, uh, professional box he's like i think he just lost his first law uh first law first fight he lost uh recently but he's great um yeah, again, Ray Sefo, I've sparred. I've sparred so many guys that, that hit very hard. And, and it's now, like a suicide yeah, mission there. Brad Tavares, one of my main uh, guys through my through when I was competing, um, sparring. He's just he's he's great now. He's learned so much. He's still in the game. Um, now, I don't, you know what I mean, I kind of know. Yeah. Like if guys are three weeks out from a fight and they have the eye of the tiger, I stay away from them. Listen, I'll wait till you six, seven weeks out so I can mix it up with you rather than when they're in that zone. Because when a guy gets closer to a fight, he's he's locked in. It's it's It'll be selfish for me to say, hey, man, slow down a little bit. Don't hit me as hard because they're already locked in and they're mm -hmm. trying to do their job. So that's what I do. I don't – if a guy has is like three weeks out from a fight, I don't, I don't really – you know, I'm not going to waste his time with a, with Jay, a round. Jay's handle on Twitter is at Jay Haran. And, again, Above the Shadows comes out on Friday on VOD. Friday, Select baby. theaters. Check that out. And Great also pre-order on iTunes. Richard, we Enjoy. got about 30 seconds. Is there anything you'd like to plug? Maybe that's coming up next for you guys, you and Frank Muir, on the Phone Booth Fighting Podcast? Uh, you know, you can just uh, subscribe. New episode goes up every week. Phone Booth Fighting, iTunes, and uh, all that. Cause I'll plug my fight. There you, go. In, oh, in you already September, got a date early October. Haven't oh. set the date yet. All right. but, uh, yeah. you, you definitely let us know. You fighting? Yeah, he's second time. He's doing the whip wow. to warrior. Uh, at at Extreme in. Couture. Okay, yeah, we're cool. up there in the morning. Yeah. Shit, at Richard really. Hunter for Richard. I'm at MMA. We're Jeff ending George. on the top. The Top Gun. Let's yeah. go. And thank you to Tito Ortiz, <laughs> Jay Haran, and Richard Hunter for their time. We'll see you all tomorrow, folks. Go out there and be a champion. <laughs>